Hello, everybody. Um, let me start by giving my own heartfelt thanks to all our supporters, friends, partners. You've so much enabled us to drive forward the work of the centre. And I know we've all got shared values and priorities. Um, I have to get these thanks out of my system because they're so fervently meant. But a huge personal thanks to Sarah alongside Andy and Jan who have so effectively and safely made the transition of the centre to home virtual working. Thanks to all each and every member of the team who have worked with such dedication and skills to continue our programme as evidence in the very impact assessment report itself. And it's all been done with such goodwill, team members supporting one another. And the last thank you, I promise. As chair of the trustees, a huge thank you to the trustees as a group who have ensured good given, governance, which matters hugely at a time like this, but beyond, gone beyond this, offering generosity of their time and expertise. So Sarah has already spoken so eloquently and with such depth of feeling from her heart while sharing with you our impact assessment report for 2020. A report that comes and has to come from the head. The centre always brings the evidence base from all sources and brings it to bear down on how, with you, we can help those tasked with the difficult job of shaping policy to develop policies that have utility but have at their very centre social justice. Already happening before COVID has been a tangible move to bringing evidence-based solutions to the table, not always just dwelling on the problem. And the solutions that have been generated that I think are most valuable have come from the grassroots and from those with lived experience, and we need to capitalise on this. The Sarah has made the ask of me to look to the future, so here goes. For those of you who know me, um, you know that I am a bit of a plain speaker and I'm also quite keen on sci-fi, so forgive me. But for 2021, there is, as Sarah said, hope, but the reality, it will be a tough year again. And together, we have to march on through this pandemic. COVID, we all know, has shown the stark reality of the inequalities gap, the widening mental health gap, the reality of poverty and desperation uh, that I never hope to see in my lifetime. These uncomfortable truths that abuse and discrimination are now never more than a dis socially distanced conversation away. And with for many, the painful reality of family loss and bereavement. But to try and move forward, which I've been asked to do positively, garnering from what we've learned so far, I have to, first sci-fi, back to the future. In 2010, the centre wisely commissioned a series of papers called 2020 Vision, several of them written by people who, who are now leaders in the field and I hope listening to what um, is being said today. One eerily um, accurate prophet of doom said climate change would it get worse, that there'd be natural man-made disasters, there'd be increased social injustice, and there would be a devastating pandemic. So that person gets full marks. But the common thread coming from other leaders at the time, from very different perspectives, can be summed up that what we need for the future is place-based health. Not the I, but the we and the us understanding what we can do to support social groups and individuals to improve their mental health and resilience. I think we have come a considerable distance, thanks to all of you, but there is so much more to do. Uh, and within the evil that is COVID, there is also an opportunity because isn't it fantastic that within a matter of weeks, we've changed regulations, we've changed laws, we've upskilled people from different fields to do jobs differently. And where do we take that to? For us, I think it's together, what are we going to do to deliver a truly integrated health and social care workforce? I happen to be a believer in integrated care systems and coordinated pathways for people. But without an integrated workforce, this isn't ever going to happen. And we need to include in that 
absolutely people with lived experience and people from across the voluntary sector. How can we support communities and protect the mental health of young people who've never experienced the world of work and those who've so cruelly lost it over the last few months? They have enormous talent and skills and shouldn't we be the first in our sector to welcome them on board, to upscale them speedily, safely and acknowledge their talents and bring them into the workforce. With the reality of long COVID, which impacts on both mind and body, and we don't even know what the final impact can be, can we work better with you? and support people with long-term physical health conditions, the people who are doing that work. But isn't this the golden opportunity to close down the mind-body dualism? We want to help people as a whole, and this year we have so many more broken people. So it won't be easy. And of course, one good way of doing all this is to accelerate the impact of the work of Equally Well. So uh, I like to sit in a back, as a backroom girl, and I'm not a loud lobbyist, but for this, I want to say we all have to come together and we have to lobby with evidence, but with volume. Are we really going to sit and wait for another long term plan for social care to emerge from the ether to only allow it to be dumped into the too difficult to do box? If there's nothing else we need to do together, it's this. It's for people across the life course who need better social care, but particularly for the elderly. I agree with Sarah um, that children have had it tough. And in the early days when we were having daily, literally virtual meetings to see how we'd keep going, at the end of the meeting, Sarah would reflect on what it was like to be a parent and a teacher with her children. And I'd reflect on my frustration. I could only support my grandchildren and my children virtually. We've shown in the impact assessment report that unfortunately children have been harmed. There are fewer mentally healthy, fewer coping, more struggling, more unwell. We have to, as a sheer matter of human rights, bring the services they need to them, how they need them, and do it swiftly. So I'm going to jump now to 2035. So in the heat and burn of your seven day working week, please just put your minds to something. If we can actually achieve what we need to do for children and young people, what it will deliver is a generation of fantastic young adult parents who can maximise their creativity whilst being content in their workplace, respecting one another. And they will have, through good mental health, help governments to do what is a tough ask, have a health creating, economically viable society. So for 2021, I do firmly believe there will be more hope, there will be some joy. What there has to be is less fear because fear drives poor decision making and we need to help the decision makers to be able to lessen their fear by being with them and supporting them. Uh, so I'm now going to um, upset anybody who doesn't like Star Wars and probably those who do because it's a misquote deliberately. But may the force be and go with everyone in all the work we can do together to improve mental health of those we serve and support. And Sarah will not forgive me if I don't finish by saying, please read this impact assessment report, absorb it, digest it, comment on it, critique it, but above all, disseminate it. Be our super spreaders because we need you. Thank you for listening.